Tick tock, time to rock. How's everyone doing? Shout out to John Davis here. It's got a new thing on uh, my program here. It's, it, it said on the screen, you got a super chat from John Davis. That's interesting wow. new feature there. Uh, all right, everyone. Well, uh, I'm David Wood. You know me. And if you've been watching, you know Tony Costa as well. He is the nicer David Wood of Canada. So, hence, hence that's probably why he's nicer. Um, hey, hey, Tony, uh, years ago, me and Sam were doing a... Uh, we're doing a live stream. Me, Sam, and Pastor Joseph. I mean, not a live stream. We're doing a show on uh, on the Trinity Channel. And uh, a guy came in. Uh, a guy called in and said, uh, "So you guys are talking about Muhammad, eh? Well, I'm gonna <laughs> hang. Right. Yeah, he goes. Well, I'm gonna hang you like like they hang Jesus and starts starts. Uh, anyways, yeah. starts talking like that, and we start high fiving and stuff. And uh, anyway, they. Uh, um, yep, we got off the we got off the line, and and Sam was going, "Man, that guy's from Canada." <laughs> Guys yeah, from Canada with the A. That's right. Guys That's from Canada with that A, and uh, it was it was interesting. Once we once the I, I don't remember if it was a commercial break or if it was uh, after the show, but the tech guys came back there and uh, came up to us and they said, as soon as uh, as soon as that guy hung up, we got a call from Homeland Security and said, give us the callback number. Wow. And yep, it was indeed Canada. And wow, uh, I, I concluded that I concluded at that moment that Homeland Security was less incompetent than we are aware of. If they're sitting there watching shows that deal with <laughs> topics related to Islam, waiting for someone to uh, let right. the cat out of the bag. Right. Right. Yep. All right. Uh, well, we are we are going to um, be talking about God in during this live stream. And uh, Tony, why don't you tell everyone why this is an important topic? Yeah, it's very important because, of course, the word God by itself um, is meaningless unless we give it a context. Um, so in Muslims and Christians and Jews and Hindus and anyone else, when they use the word God, we need to define those terms. What do we mean by God? And so at the end of the day, what ends up happening is a lot of Christians and Muslims, when they talk about God, they end up equivocating. The fallacy of equivocation is when we use the same words when the meanings and the definitions are different. And so I think we need to define what we mean by God, both in a Christian context and both in a Muslim context. Yeah, now this is uh, this is kind of a uh, slightly tricky one because um, it seems like, you know, obviously there's a, there's a world of difference between, um, let's say, the God of the Bible and Zeus. Right. Uh, with Allah, you're 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 closer than with Zeus, and so the question is like like what's the what's the line? Because you don't want to get you don't want to get too nitpicky. Otherwise, you have to say that you know Christians of different denominations are worshiping different gods because they have uh, mm -hmm. some different beliefs about uh, you know God and so on. Uh, what do you think? What do you think about that? What how would you determine whether you're um, whether you're dealing with a, the same God or a different God? Well, I think at the end of the day, we need to define uh, what we believe about God. Uh, Muslims believe in a Unitarian God, that God is only one person, one being, whereas Christians historically and through the creeds of the church have always affirmed that God is triune, that God is Father, Son, Holy Spirit. And so as Christians, we are Trinitarian monotheists, whereas Muslims are Unitarian monotheists. And that makes a world of a difference. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. All right, everyone. Well, um, I know Tony has talked about this topic a, a ton of times and uh, done tons of debates with Muslims on this. So I'm just going to give him the floor here for a while while I check out the uh, check out the comments and uh, let him go ahead and introduce the topic, um, state his case, and then we'll uh, we'll we'll then we'll we'll just uh, start taking uh, questions from the chat and. Uh, See where it goes from there. All right, so Tony, the floor Thanks. the floor is yours, sir. Thanks, David. So I want to begin by first uh, asserting that I do not believe that the God of the Bible and the God of the Quran are the same God. And I want to begin with uh, Surah 29, verse 46 in the Quran, which says this, And argue not with the people of the Scripture, unless it be in a way that is better, save with such of them as do wrong, and say, We believe in that which has been revealed unto us and revealed unto you, 
our God and your God is one, and unto him we surrender. Now, what this passage of the Quran tells us is that the Muslims are told not to argue with the people of the scripture, that is the Jews and the Christians, unless it is in a way that is better. Uh, and and to, to uh, acknowledge and to say that they believe in what has been revealed to the Muslims and what has been revealed to the Jews and the Christians, but also that our God and your God is one. So the Quran says two things here. The scriptures of the Jews and the Christians have to be acknowledged and believed by the Muslims. Number two, the God of the Christians and the Jews is supposed to be believed to be the same God as the God who revealed himself to Muhammad. Now, we have a, a major dilemma here. Muslims do not believe in the scriptures of the Jews and the Christians. They argue that our scriptures have been corrupted and therefore we need the Quran. So now they're in a bit of a dilemma because if they affirm the scriptures have been corrupted, then they contradict the revelation of Allah in this passage. Now, if they deny that the scriptures, um, if they affirm that the scriptures given to the Jews and the Christians are from uh, Allah, then they have to reject Islam because the Christian scriptures say that Jesus was the son of God, that he died on the cross, that he was resurrected, etc. The same thing goes for the second clause there, our God and your God is one. If that is the case, if Muslims believe that the God of the Bible and the God of the Quran are the same, well, then Muslims would have to accept the Trinity. But since they don't accept the Trinity, they have to reject what the Quran says here. And now they're in another dilemma. If they affirm our God is the same, then they have to believe in the triune God. If they deny our God is the same, they have to deny the Quran and believe that what Allah revealed to Muhammad was an error. The other thing we need to realize is that the God of the Bible reveals himself by a certain name. And that name is known as the Tetragrammaton, which is the four letters of God's name, Y-H-W-H, and it's usually pronounced Yahweh. And the name Yahweh was revealed by God. Uh, and in Exodus 3, 13 to 15, God says that this is my memorial name forever. And that name means the eternal, the one who is, who was, who is to come. It's God's personal covenant name. The God of the Quran, on the other hand, is referred to as Allah. And Allah in the Arabic is a, a contraction of two words, al-ilah, which means the God. And the word Allah really is not a personal name. It's actually more of a title. And so the God of Islam really has no name. He's more impersonal than the God of the Bible, who is Yahweh. The other thing is the relationship between Yahweh and people in the Bible is a relationship between father and child or father and son and daughter. And the paradigm, therefore, is that God becomes a father to his people. He was the father of Israel in the Old Testament. He's the father of Christian believers through Jesus Christ. Now, even though the Bible does speak of the master-servant relationship, that God is also master and we are servants of God, it emphasizes God's fatherliness, that God is a father to his people. Whereas in the Quran and in Islam, the paradigm between God and uh, his people is that of a master and a slave. So that Muslims and all humanity, all of creation is basically servants or slaves of Allah. Now, let's look a little bit at the Trinity and, and, and the whole view of the Trinitarian view of God and, and the Unitarian view of God. The Bible teaches that God is one in his being, his essence, but that God reveals himself tripersonally, that is his Father, Son, Holy Spirit. In Islam, Allah is an absolute unity. So the most important uh, surah in the Quran is Surah 112, Ali Klas. And in Surah 112, it says that Allah is one. And it also says in verse 3, Lam yalid wa lam yalud, which means he begets not, nor is he begotten. Now, you need to understand something about Islam. It cannot exist, I submit, without Christianity. It defines itself against Christianity. That's why uh, the creed in Islam begins with negative particles. For example, the Shahada says, La ilaha illa Allah. There is no God but Allah. And in Surah uh, Ali Klaas, Surah 112, uh, verse 3, it says, Lam yalid, he does not beget. Walam yuludu, he, does, he is not begotten. And clearly what this is saying is that this is language that is um, opposed to the language of Nicaea, that Christ is the eternally begotten Son of God. And therefore, what the Quran does is it defines God against that view of Christianity. And so when we move on, 
we realize that the God of the Bible is transcendent, but he's also imminent, that is, he's near to us. The God of Islam is transcendent, but he is ultimately unknowable. There is nothing like him. He's not comparable to anything. And therefore, Allah has a transcendence that is so huge that he is virtually unknowable. Now, here's a couple of things I do need to emphasize. God is eternally loving. God is eternally a communicator. God is the very basis of community and logic. And God loves unconditionally. And because the God of the Bible is a community within himself, namely a triune being, God has eternally loved himself through the persons of the Trinity. That is to say, the Father always loved the Son, the Son always loved the Father, the Father loves the Spirit, the Spirit loves the Father, etc. In other words, God is a fully perfect, content, complete being within himself. He needs nothing for his existence. He doesn't need to be in relationship with finite creatures. He created us out of his grace, out of his pleasure, and for his glory. Whereas the God of the Quran is not eternally loving. There was a time when Allah was alone. There was nothing but Allah. Who did Allah love? Well, there was nothing for him to love because in order to love, you need a subject-object relationship. You need a, a lover and you need a beloved. There has to be a subject-object relationship. But since Allah is a Unitarian being, there's nothing for him to love. There's nothing for him to communicate with. And therefore, Allah is virtually an eternal mute. He was a mute who didn't speak to anyone because there was no one else. Whereas in the biblical view of God, God communicated within himself. That's why John 1.1 1, 1 says, in the beginning was the Word, and the Logos, the Word, was with God, and the Word was God. He was face to face with God from all eternity. Now, why is this important? It's important because a Unitarian God is a God that needs something to relate to. He needs to create creatures that he can communicate with and have them worship him. That's why the Quran says, Allah only made men so that they would worship him. And therefore, a Unitarian God is a God that cannot be the greatest conceivable being. I'm using a bit of St. Anselm's language here of the ontological argument, that a being who is the greatest conceivable being would it be a being who has no necessities or needs or lacks anything. The God of the Quran lacks something. He lacks creatures to acknowledge him as God and to worship him. The God of the Bible doesn't need us. We need him. And so God has eternally been loving. The God of the Quran is not eternally loving. He had to create things in order to be loved. Now, the Bible says that God loves us unconditionally. We did not first love him. He first loved us. In the Quran, Surah 3, verse 31, it says, if you love Allah and if you uh, follow me, then Allah will love you. And notice that Allah's love is conditioned upon you believing in Muhammad and following Muhammad, then he will love you. Whereas the biblical God loves us first before we loved him. And that's why the Bible says God is love. Now in the Quran, and the 99 names of Allah, he's never called love. He is called Al-Wadud, which means the loving but that doesn't mean he is eternally loved. He's only loving to those who love him first. And so that distinction, is, that distinction is important. Let me just say a couple of things as well about Yahweh and Allah. Yahweh is restricted by his perfect nature. He cannot lie. He cannot sin. He cannot deny himself. He is, he is pure spirit. Allah, on the other hand, is not restricted by anything. He can do whatever he wants. He could lead people astray. He can mislead them. He is uh, the greatest of schemers, al Uh He is described as having a body with face and hands, eyes, a shin, whereas the biblical God is pure spirit. And Jesus said a spirit does not have flesh and bones, as I do, that is, in his resurrected body. Yahweh is holy. His worshipers are called to be holy. In the Quran, the holiness of Allah is rarely referred to. It appears to be a very minor and secondary attribute of Allah. And in fact, Allah is only called holy or pure only two times in the Quran, whereas the Bible is permeated, saturated with God's holiness. In the Bible, we see the atonement for sin is made. God provides an atonement. Jesus comes as our Passover lamb to redeem us because we cannot redeem ourselves. Whereas in the Quran, Allah demands us to fulfill our good works, do good works in order to be saved. A couple more things. Allah can indwell his creation. He can enter into his creation uh, to redeem humanity. We see that in the Garden of Eden, where he walked in the garden. 
We see it in the Exodus. We appeared in the fire to Moses. He comes into the temple. And ultimately, God comes into the world through the Lord Jesus Christ in the Incarnation. And then the Holy Spirit indwells believers in Jesus. We are temples of the Holy Spirit. The God of the Quran does not indwell anyone. He does not enter into his creation. And this is clearly taught in Islam. Yahweh creates humans in his image. Humans have dignity, integrity, because God made us in his image and in his likeness. He created us to enter into a loving relationship with him by saving them by grace. And we have our salvation secure in Christ because Christ is a perfect savior. Whereas in the Quran, the Quran never says we're made in God's image, but the Hadith does. The Hadith of Bukhari and Muslim actually say that God made Adam in his likeness, his image, and made him 90 feet tall. Uh, nothing in creation is like Allah. Uh, people must not seek to be like Allah, whereas we're told that we ought to imitate Christ, we're to imitate God, we're made in God's likeness. And humans are only slaves. They're only made to worship Allah and nothing else. The other thing we need to understand is this. Well, if the Allah of the Quran, the God of the Quran, is not the God of the Bible, then where does he come from? Well, Allah was already worshipped long before Muhammad. He was worshipped by the pagan Arabs. He was acknowledged as one of their deities. He was the chief and high god of the Arabic pantheon of 360 gods. He was the head god of the Kaaba. He was considered the creator god. But remember, he was not the only god. His own father, Muhammad's own father, was named Abdullah or Abdullah, which means slave of Allah, long before Muhammad. Allah was believed to have had three daughters, and these three daughters are actually mentioned in the Quran in Surah 53, verses 19 to 22. They're called Al-Uzza, Al-At, and Manat, who represented correspondingly the sun, the planet Venus, and fortune, respectively. So let me end with this. Uh, we're also told in the Quran that Allah prays. And so in Surah 33, verse 43 and verse 56, uh, if you look at the Palmer translation, it says, he it is, Allah, who prays, the Arabic there is Yusali, for you, Muhammad, and his angels too, to bring you forth out of the darkness into the light. For he is merciful to the believers. Verily, God and his angels pray, that's the Arabic plural, Yusaluna, for the prophet, all you who believe, pray for him and salute him with the salutation. Now, if Allah prays, we have to ask the question. Prayer is a subject-object relation. If Allah prays, then who is he praying to? Because whoever he's praying to is necessarily greater than him. You only pray to that which is above you. And so in the Hadith, we have corroboration for this. In the Hadith al qudsiya it says this, it says this, Hadith 216. The Israelites said to Moses, does your Lord pray? And Moses said, fear Allah, O sons of Israel. Allah said, O Musa, Moses, what did your people say? Musa, Moses, said, O oh my Lord, you already know. They said, Does your Lord pray? Allah said, Tell them, My prayer for my servants is that my mercy should precede my anger. If it were not so, I would have destroyed them. So once again, who is Allah praying to? Tafsir ibn Kathir. When ibn Kathir comments on this verse, you'll hear a lot of Muslims say, No, 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 the word there means to, to, to send blessings on the Prophet. But listen to the most respected uh, commentator, the classical commentator on the Quran, Ibn Kathir, says this, The people of Israel said to Moses, Does your Lord pray? His Lord called them and said, O oh Moses, they asked you if your Lord prays. Say to them, Yes, I do pray, and my angels pray upon my prophets and my messengers. And Allah sent them down on his messenger, quote, Allah and his angels pray. That is Surah 33, verse 56. So Ibn Kathir acknowledged that this was referring to prayer. And finally, the Muslim commentator uh, at Termidi, speaking about that same verse, says this. Uba Omama reported that the Messenger of Allah said, Allah and his angels and the people of the heavens and the earth, even the ants in their rocks and the fish, pray for blessing on those who teach people good. So, in conclusion, when we compare the God of Islam with the God of the Bible, we realize that even though the words are the same, <coughs> Their characteristics are worlds apart. And this is why the early Jews and the early Muslims rejected Islam, because they did not see the God of their scriptures in the Quran. And secondly, they didn't see the Jesus of the Bible accurately uh, portrayed in the Quran. And that is why the people of the book rejected the message of Muhammad, 
because it contradicted their own scriptures. Now, our Arabic brothers and sisters, our Arabic brothers and sisters in Christ, do use the word Allah when they refer to uh, God in their Arabic Bibles. But it's important to realize that our Arabic brothers and sisters will clearly say and differentiate the Allah of the Bible in the Arabic Bible from the Allah of the Quran. The Allah of the Bible is the triune God, Father, Son, Holy Spirit, whereas the Allah of the Quran is a Unitarian being. Thank you. Thanks, David. <clears throat> Thank you, Tony. And uh, we've got uh, we got some questions lined up already. Um, uh, a couple of you asked how to follow uh, Tony stuff and asked if he had a YouTube channel. I put a link in the description box to uh, a channel uh, that Tony does lots of videos uh, for called The Third Degree, but that link is in the description box so you can get that. All right. I um, think I could take this first question here. This is from Wahid. Uh, Nadafi says, can you show us where God puts the sins of the Muslims on the backs of Jews in the Quran. He says, I can't find it. Uh, well, uh, Wahid, that's not actually from the Quran. That's from Muhammad. So that's from Muhammad in the Hadith. Uh, what you do have in the Quran is you, you have the Quran contradicting itself. So some passages will say that uh, 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 no bearer of burden shall bear the burden of another. And then you go to other passages and it says that people will bear their own bur their own burdens and the burdens of others. So you have that, that kind of contradiction there, uh, as well as... Um, when the Quran says um, that no bearer of burden shall bear the burden of another, that's actually leaving the door open for the gospel because I, I've heard this over and over again. I've seen Muslims, they'll quote that verse, no bearer of burden. I mean, there's multiple verses, but they'll, they'll, they'll quote that and then they'll say, see, according to the Quran, no one can bear the burden of another. Not what it says. It doesn't say no one. It says no bearer of burden shall bear the burden of another. In other words, no one who already has a burden of sin shall bear the burden of another. It's kind of good theology there, but the Christian message is that is not that Jesus, who had a burden of sin, bore the burdens of others. It's that Jesus, who had no burden, and the the Quran there would leave that wide open. Um, but as for as for the passages where Muhammad says that uh, Allah will put the sins of Muslims on the backs of Jews and Christians, um, there are a couple different editions of Sahih Muslim. The 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 one that's usually online, I'll give you that uh, numbering system, so you can look that up. Uh, Sahih Muslim 6665, 6666, 6667, and 6668. Uh, let me just read 6668 here. Allah's messenger said, There would come people amongst the Muslims on the day of resurrection with as heavy sins as a mountain, and Allah would forgive them, and he would place in their stead the Jews and the Christians. So you have you have uh, several passages like this in Sahih Muslim. You also have in uh, a work called uh, 110 Ahadith Qudsi. Uh, Hadith Qudsi are uh, passages where you have Allah speaking. Um, but 110 Ahadith Qudsi, number eight. Go ahead and read that real quick. Allah's messenger said, on the day of resurrection, my ummah will be gathered into three groups. One sort will enter paradise without rendering an account of their deeds. Another sort will be reckoned an easy account and admitted into paradise. Yet another sort will come bearing on their backs heaps of sins like great mountains. Allah will ask the angels, though he knows best about them, who are these people? They will reply, they are humble slaves of yours. He will say, unload the sins from them and put the same over the Jews and Christians. Then let the humble slaves get into paradise by virtue of my mercy. So Allah's mercy here is taking the sins off of Muslims. Uh, and these are Muslims who have sins as heavy as mountains, so mountains of sins. And Allah uh, orders the angels to take their sins and put them on the backs of Jews and Christians. And Jews and Christians will then be punished in hell for the sins of Muslims. Why is this important? Well, because Muslims love to say, well, if Jesus died for your sins, then you can sin all you want. Or um, if, uh, you know, you Christians, you believe that Jesus died for your sins, how, how is that just? This would be like God punishing a baby for, for what a murderer has done. They'll, they'll, they'll go with things like that. But uh, at the end of the day, gosh, Allah is punishing me and Tony here for things that Muslims have done. Um, so if you got a problem with that, then you got a problem with your prophet and Muhammad would turn out to be a false prophet. By the way, the difference between um, Christianity and Islam here is that Jesus was sinless. So even according to the Quran, he's the only person who could 
who could accept this, the, the penalty for the sins of others. Uh, and the other difference is he did so willingly, right? Um, me, and, me and Tony are not volunteering here to take, your, uh, to take the penalty for your sins. Uh, anything you want to add to that, uh, Tony? No, I think you uh, you artic articulated that very well, David, that in the Bible, Jesus is the Lamb of God who takes the sins of the world upon himself and he removes them. And so uh, what you said is exactly on target. And the Quran does end up uh, contradicting itself mm -hmm. because uh, it's, it's totally true that uh, a bearer of burdens cannot bear the burdens of another. A sinner cannot bear the sins of another, but a sinless one can definitely take the sins of the other upon himself. That's classic Christian theology. Yeah, and uh, um, you were mentioning when, when you were talking uh, that, that Islam runs into a lot of dilemmas by affirming things, by affirming things, um, and this by affirming scripture things, uh, scriptural things uh, for Jews and Christians. Right. And it keeps leaving Muslims in the position of, well, if you go this way, then Islam is false. And if you go that way, Islam is false. Um, you have something like that here as well. You pointed out Jesus is the, uh, is the Lamb of God. Um, John the Baptist identifies Jesus as the Lamb of God in John 1, and he does it right after the passage that Muslims love to quote, uh, right. where, where people come to John and say, um, are you the Christ? Are you the prophet? And so they were, right. they were expecting someone different. Muslims love to go there. Zakir Naik right. goes there. Muslim apologists go there. Shabir Ali goes there. They all go there. And then right after that, John the Baptist identifies Jesus as both the Son of God and as the Lamb of God who takes right. away the sin of the world. Um, unfortunately, they don't. They don't. They just don't go that far. Uh, but that, that's an, that's another situation where you have a dilemma because the Quran affirms our scriptures, and Muslim apologists themselves are affirming this passage. And so, well, if it's the word of God, then Islam is false. If it's not the word of God, then Islam is false for affirming our scriptures. And right. so they keep running into these problems. Um, all right. Well, we have uh, we have some questions here. This is actually a, a good one for you. Diva Girl Love says, why didn't prophets before Jesus say that God was triune? So uh, so you've got uh, the New Testament claiming that God is triune. Why didn't earlier prophets make these kinds of claims? Yeah, the, the, the Trinity, the formulation of the Trinity is something that begins in uh, germ form, if you will, in the Old Testament, and it's progressively revealed. Um, Jewish scholars uh, openly admit that the idea of a plurality within the Godhead is something that is found in the Old Testament. It's sometimes called the two powers in heaven. Um, if you read the book, The Two Powers in Heaven by Alan Segal, he goes into great detail about how the Jews believed in a plurality within the Godhead up until the year AD 200, when Christians began to use passages from the Old Testament to show that there was this plurality within the Godhead. Um, if you read the Michael Heiser, for example, Michael Heiser has done a lot of work in this area as well. N.T. Wright has also written on this. The idea of plurality within God is already seen in the Old Testament. You see it in Genesis 1. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. The Spirit of God moved over the waters, and then God spoke. You've got God, you've got the Spirit, you've got God's Word. Uh, Genesis 1.26, when God creates Adam, let us make man in our image after our likeness. There's uh, uh, plural pronouns being used there. We have a figure in the Old Testament called, uh, in Hebrew, uh, Malach Yahweh, which is the angel of Yahweh, the angel of the Lord, who is identified as Yahweh, but yet distinguished from Yahweh. So if you look at Genesis 19.24, you'll notice that Yahweh caused fire and brimstone to come upon Sodom and Gomorrah from Yahweh out of the heavens. There's two persons there called Yahweh. And as we move through the Old Testament into the prophets, you begin to see passages where Yahweh sends Yahweh. Yahweh is sent by Yahweh and his spirit. And so by the time you get to the New Testament, it's no surprise that the early Christians were uh, comfortable with the idea that Jesus was God in the flesh, that they worshiped him, they, they invoked him in prayer, they sang hymns to him. And so the idea of God's triunity was something that was already held to uh, in the Old Testament period, it came to fruition and flourished under the New Testament. Um, and so what the person is presuming here is that the Trinity, if the Trinity was true, why didn't they use that language? Well, Trinity is a Latin term, 
There was no Latin in the Old Testament, obviously. So what they would do is they would use personal pronouns. They would use words like the name for God, uh, Yahweh, was singular, but the word God, Elohim, was a third person plural. And in Genesis 1.1, uh, it says, But ashit, but Elohim, it has shemaim ve'et haretz. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. The word Elohim there is a third person plural, masculine, which should tr be translated gods, but if you notice, whenever the true God is identified, the the verb that associates with that noun is always in the singular. So the word to create, bara, is singular. And that indicates to the reader that this God, even though he is plural, he is yet one at the same time. So what I would say is that if you read uh, people like N.T. Wright, John, uh, Michael Heiser, Alan Segal, and others, um, there's another scholar from the Jewish Theological Seminary in New York, a boy or I believe his name in, who says that the concept of the Trinity is not antithetical to Judaism, but would be at home within a Jewish setting. So even Jewish scholars are coming to the conclusion that the idea of plurality in God is not foreign to Judaism. So, so um, just to, just to recap, and and you've pointed this out uh, uh, many times, and I've seen you point this out in debates as well. Um, as far as Jews during the time of Jesus, they had a variety of beliefs, but it was just very right. common to view God as having a a plural nature, a plurality right. uh, of persons within the one God. And it was around uh, 200 AD when uh, Jewish scholars wanted to sort of separate Suppress. themselves from Christianity, distinguish themselves Correct. from what Christians were saying. And that's when Correct. they became the, the sort of uh, uh, stringent uh, Unitarians. Exactly. Yep. Exactly, David. And, and it was the rabbis who began to push back against mm -hmm. that. And so what you will notice is that whenever God is spoken of in the, in the Bible, the Hebrew Bible, as one, like in the Shema, the word for God's oneness is Echad. And in Hebrew, there's two words for one. It's, there's the word Echad and Yachid. And Echad, uh, whenever it is used, it's used in a context where there's plurality and unity. So Genesis 1.5 says that God made uh, light and darkness. And then it says, Yom Echad, it was evening and morning, one day. And in the, in the Shema, Deuteronomy 6.4, God's unity is described as Echad, which means composite unity. Now, to support what you just said there, David, uh, Maimonides in the 13th century, the medieval Jewish scholar who codified the 13 articles of Judaism uh, in Orthodox Judaism, um, the, the, the article that speaks of God says that, that the Creator, blessed be He, is Yachit, he is one, he's an absolute unity. Now it's important to realize that the word that Maimonides uses there for God's oneness, Yachit, is not the word that the Hebrew Bible uses for God's oneness. The word the Hebrew Bible uses to refer to God as one is always Echad, which is a composite unity. Uh, and so all that to say that the rabbis try to move away from this concept of this composite unity and the very word today they use for God's oneness is not the one that the, the Torah or the Pentateuch or even the Tanakh, the whole Old Testament, uses for God's oneness. So it was a suppression, really. Uh, since, since you know Hebrew, um, when the Bible says um, that that God made Adam and Eve one flesh, what, what's used there for, for it's one? The word is, is basar echad, mm -hmm. basar echad, and it means uh, the two are one. So male and female are one flesh in marriage. So it's the same word to refer to composite unity. And so this is important because Muslims love to just go up. Oh, it says right there, God is one. That means oneness in the sense that we're using it. Right. And it's just, that's that's just not how, it, how it's used. I even have a, uh, I have a, I have a Jewish commentary called the, the Zohar, uh, yes. which is, which is, uh, uh, and when it's given the commentary on, uh, on the Shema, uh, it starts talking about, it, it, it's again, a, J a Jewish commentary, but it points out that, what the Shema actually says, if you if you don't you know add add words to it, it, it just says, um, "Hear, O Israel." Um, it's if you again, it's difficult because we think of it, we we have to put sure. it in like we have to put it in like sentence form. The Lord right. our God is one Lord. We have to we have right. to add words to it. Um, but in the Hebrew, it just names God three times and then says one. Correct. Yeah, it just says, so it says uh, Yahweh, uh, Eloheinu, Yahweh, one. And right. so it names God three times. And the the uh, the Zohar is commenting on this saying, uh, 
we have three names of God and then one. How are we to how are we to reconcile that the three names are one? And it says right. that we do this by faith and so on. And so uh, it's very interesting that Muslims take a passage which even a Jewish commentary is 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 pointing out that this is. It's actually pointing out a plurality within the one right. God and saying that we have we just have to accept it by faith, and then Muslims go to this as like their proof text of uh, Islamic Unitarianism. Very very yeah. strange stuff. Yeah, and they're equivocating, right, David? They're taking the word one and they're equivocating. Yep. They're assuming that the word one there means absolute unity in a mm -hmm. Unitarian context, and it doesn't. Yep. Um, all right, let, we'll go through uh, a couple more comments. I actually want to pull up some comments. Uh, Diva Girl Love, go ahead and pull up all your objections. Sometimes I like to focus on uh, one person. By the way, Diva Girl Love, uh, we have a series on th this issue that uh, you brought up here um, on my channel by Anthony Rogers. So if you go to uh, my channel page, look for, um, I think it's called The Trinity in Jewish and Christian Scriptures, and it shows how this was unveiled, um, how this was unveiled. Um, during during the the Old Testament period, how you this was revealed mm -hmm. this this plurality of persons. So check that out. Uh, I think there's uh, about six videos in there now. So go ahead and check that out. Um, Bento Fernandez, uh, this is on a different topic, but it's easy to answer. It says, brother David, what do you think of the passage in the Quran, which says that if you kill one innocent person, it is as if you've killed all mankind and vice versa. Well, I, I think a couple things. One, if you if you actually read the passage in Surah five thirty two. It says that this was a Jewish teaching, said that Allah revealed to the Jews. And the reason it says this is the Jews of Muhammad's time were saying this. And Muhammad heard the Jews saying it. And this, uh, interestingly, the Allah doesn't, uh, the Allah of the Quran can't distinguish between uh, information that is actually in the Torah and things that were in uh, uh, the, the, the Talmud. So this is a quotation from Mishnah Sanhedrin. And this was a Jewish this was a Jewish teaching, and th this wasn't even something that supposedly came from God. This was a Jewish commentary um, on the on the story of of Cain and Abel, and it was based on uh, a sort of literal reading of the text, which we read it as God saying that um, that Abel's blood cries out from the ground, and the the uh, Jewish commentator points out that it actually says his bloods plural cries out. And so the uh, Jewish commentator comments that this is God telling us that it, it's not just Abel's blood, it's all his future generations. And so his commentary is that what this means is that if you've killed a man, it's you, you've, killed, you've killed all his future generations. So you've killed, it's as if you've killed all mankind. And so uh, Muhammad heard the Jews saying this and Again, couldn't tell the difference between that and something that's actually in the Torah. And so, but even there in Surah 5, verse 32, it says that this is something that the Jews taught. This was revealed to the Jews. The very next verse, 533, tells Muslims to go on all kinds of killing sprees for all kinds of crimes. Um, it says that uh, if you commit the vague crime of making mischief in the land, then the punishment is... Um, death, uh, crucifixion, uh, can be dismemberment, chopping off body parts, or uh, exile from the land. So, uh, gosh, I mean, you, you can go, You e even today, if you uh, look at what someone will be charged with in a place like Saudi Arabia or a place like Iran, so Sunni, Shia, doesn't matter, they will charge you with making mischief in the Muslim land if they don't have a more specific crime to, uh, to accuse you of. And where do they get this? From the very next verse. So, so Bento. When you see uh, when you see people pointing out, but the Quran says, if anyone kills a man, it's as if he's killed all mankind. Well, it says that's what the Jews taught, and the very next verse tells Muslims to kill all kinds of people for all kinds of reasons, very vague reasons. Which, when you're killing people, you want to be very clear what you're killing them about. The Quran just isn't. So, those are my thoughts on that. All right, Tony, another question yeah, from. Well, I'll, oh, well, can I just quickly comment on that yep, as yep. well? Well, that just to throw another monkey wrench in there in, in Surah 25, when Muhammad is is being told that. Everything that he says has been, uh, they've heard this before. There's nothing new here. These are mm -hmm. just tales of the ancients that they mm -hmm. have heard. That's the accusation that is made. Muhammad, you're bringing nothing new to us. We've heard all this before. Mm -hmm. And then the reply Muhammad is given by Allah is say to them, no, this is sent down from he who knows the secrets and the mysteries. Um, so what the Quran is basically saying is that the very contents of the Quran have been sent down from Allah, that they're not earthly in their, in their origin. But as you rightly pointed out, this story comes from the Talmud. 
which mm -hmm. is not part of the Hebrew Scriptures. It is commentary on the Hebrew Scriptures, and therefore they're not part of God's inspired word. Uh, the Quran didn't know that. Muhammad didn't know that. He just mm -hmm. assumed it was revelation. Uh, and so here we have a case of plagiarism where Muhammad copies from the Jews and then claims that it is from Allah. So, um, so that what we have here is another dilemma. The Quran claims to be from Allah, but its contents are clearly uh, can be traced to various sources, mm -hmm. earthly mm -hmm. sources. Yep. Indisputably. Um, all right. Here's another from uh, Diva Girl Love. She says, uh, does Jesus pray to the Father? If yes, why? So these are not uh, new objections here. Uh, yeah. Does Jesus pray to the Father? If yes, why is he subordinate to the Father? Jesus prays to the Father because as a man, that is what a perfect human being, the perfect man, who is the perfect example of godliness, would be a man of prayer. And so uh, in the incarnation, Jesus Christ communicated with the Father. He's the only one that the Father granted every request to. God never said, uh, God always granted, always heard Christ. Um, and in the uh, post-resurrection, in, in his in His present uh, ministry as the great mediator and high priest of his people, the Son continues to communicate with the Father. Our God is a communicating God. The God of the Scriptures is an eternal communicator. He's been communicating from eternity. Uh, and therefore, um, in his humanity, Jesus did take uh, a role of humiliation. Uh, he became flesh. He took the form of a slave, a servant. And as a man, he humbled himself to the point of death. And so, as a human being, Jesus did subordinate himself to the Father, which is what every perfect human being is called to do. But Jesus Christ is not just human. He's also God. He's the eternal Word who became flesh the one through whom all things were made. And so in Christianity, we make a clear distinction that Jesus Christ is one person who has two natures. He is both God and man. We don't confuse those natures, but we maintain that he is both divine and human at the same time. But he continues to communicate with the Father. Um, so, uh, Diva Girl Love, I know you're still in the chat, so I, I, I hope you're getting this, right? Because... Um, you know, we, we, we get these, we get these questions all the time, right? Um, as Tony pointed out earlier, you have Quran references to Allah praying, right? Allah praying, Quran and the Hadith, you have references to Allah praying. If you have a Unitarian deity, then you've got all kinds of problems here because Allah is either praying to someone else, in which case, who's he praying to, or he's praying to himself, uh, which is kind of strange. If you are a Trinitarian who also believes in the Incarnation and the Divine Son, God the Son enters creation as Jesus of Nazareth, I don't know why you'd expect him to become an atheist. He's had a relationship with the Father from all eternity, and if he's going to continue that relationship as a man, he would do so through prayer. So Jesus praying to the Father makes perfect sense. Given Christian doctrine, it doesn't make sense when you ignore all of Christian doctrine, which is what every Muslim does, right? They ignore everything we everything we say about God being a trinity and everything we say about the incarnation. And then they say, oh, well, Jesus is praying. Who's he praying to? It doesn't make any sense, right? Um, so, yeah, it makes perfect sense for us if you take it in the light of Christian theology. It makes no sense for, for Islam. Um, so, uh, hope that helps, and we'll, uh, we'll, we'll, <laughs> we'll look at some more. Uh, Diva Girl Love here. Uh, you... Uh, you, you've, you've pretty much already ans answered this, uh, Tony, um, but I'll go ahead and add her comment here. She says, does the Father pray to the Son? So she's pointing out, well, Jesus prays to the Father, but the Father doesn't pray to the Son. So go ahead and point, yeah. out, go ahead and point out the obvious there. Again, again, every time uh, we hear about Jesus praying, it's always in the context of his incarnation. Um, and so before the incarnation, the Son doesn't pray to the Father, and the Father doesn't pray to the Son. Because prayer implies, again, a, a subordination of one to the other. You, you obviously pray to one who's, who's above you. And so in the incarnation, Jesus took on the form of a servant. Philippians 2 is very clear on this. He took on the form of a slave, a servant. And as a human being, what did he do? He prayed. Now, there's nothing to suggest that the Father prays to the Son because the Father didn't become incarnate. The Holy Spirit didn't become incarnate. And therefore, every time we see prayer with Jesus, it's always in the context 
of the incarnation. He is a human being, and what does every perfect human being do? He is called, as David rightly pointed out, Jesus was not an atheist. He prayed, and that's what every perfect human being is called to do in Christ. We're called to pray. And that's why there's no such thing as the Father praying to the Son, because prayer presumes that uh, that uh, one is is in a lower position than another. And in the Incarnation, Jesus took on a lower position, and therefore he prayed. Um, there's another question from... Uh... From Diva Girl Love, she says, uh, Acts 17, what do you think about Hebrews 5, 7? So uh, kind of jumping into some other topics here, but uh, again, sometimes uh, just happy to focus on one person's questions, knowing that uh, if we answer that one person's questions, and maybe, maybe something will sink in. Um, all right, let me go ahead and read Hebrews 5, 7. Uh, I'll explain how Muslims misuse this text, and then we'll see what happens. Uh, all right, Hebrews 5, 7. In the days of his flesh, he offered up both prayers and supplications. So this is Jesus. Jesus offered up both prayers and supplications with loud crying and tears to the one who is able to save him from death, and he was heard because of his piety. So Jesus prayed to the one who could save him from death, and he was heard. So Muslims point this out because Muslims want to say that Jesus um, didn't die and wasn't crucified. And of course, the New Testament says over and over and over and over and over and over and over again, like a beating drum that Jesus died. Again, these are texts that the Quran affirms as the word of God. So what do Muslims do? Well, they have to look for something to twist. So Tony, is it reasonable to read this verse, Hebrews 5, 7, and say, you see right here, this verse is saying that Jesus never died. He prayed to the one who could save him from death, and his prayer was heard. Therefore, we can ignore everything else the New Testament says. Here you have it. Islam is true. Right. right. Well, one, one uh, point that we should always establish, and this applies to the reading of the Quran as well, you never, ever, ever, ever read a text in isolation. In other words, you don't just go uh, into tunnel vision and look at one verse and then ignore everything around it. Muslims wouldn't accept that mm -hmm. if we treated the Quran that way. So in the letter to the Hebrews, which, is, which speaks about Christ's sacrificial death, his priesthood, it talks about him being the lamb. It talks about him, uh, uh, Hebrews 1, 3, after he... Uh, uh, accomplished uh, redemption for us. After he purged our sins in his own blood, he sat down at the right hand of God, uh, the majesty on high. The book of Hebrews makes it very clear that Jesus died, that he made atonement. And it also says that Jesus Christ is true God. He is the express image of God's nature. The Father calls him God in Hebrews 1.8. He calls him Lord Yahweh in Hebrews uh, 1, 10 to 12. He, of course, Muslims will ignore all those passages. Um, and so, if we're going to read this verse, we have to interpret it in the light of the greater context. Well, what does it mean that he cried uh, to him? Well, obviously, he was a human being. He prayed. We already discussed that already. And that he was able, he cried to him, he was able to redeem him from death. But what our Muslim friends don't realize is that redemption from death is a, a medium that Jews would use to refer to resurrection. When you are resurrected, you are saved out of the, uh, uh, the Sheol, the place of the dead, and so, so forth. So, so, so death, death is a place you go right. to. So it doesn't say that yeah. he prayed to the one who could save him from dying. Exactly. For, for, for Jews, death is a place you go to. And That's so right. to save you from it, to save you from it would be taking you out of it, right? Which, to, bring it out, to bring you out of it, which yeah. he was. He was, he, uh, he was brought out. Remember uh, Psalm 16:10, which is quoted by Peter in Acts 2, you will not leave your holy one in Sheol. You will not allow his flesh to see corruption. And so resurrection means that God is able to take people out of Sheol and bring them back to the land of the living. Mm -hmm. And so what, what, what has been done here, David, is they've ignored the language of, of the text. They've ignored the idioms that were known to the, the first uh, century uh, early Christians. But to read that one verse and ignore the rest of Hebrews, which is the strongest letter in the New Testament that bases itself on, on the whole Levitical law, the, the law of, of the sacrifices, the blood atonement, and so forth, uh, to do that is really to strain, a, you know, it's to strain a gnat and swallow a camel. Uh, so the context, I think, is very clear on this, David, that 
what it's saying there is that he was hurt and he was saved from what? He was saved from Sheol by resurrection. Mm. And and again, as you pointed out, all you have to do is read the book of Hebrews to see yeah. what this means. In other words, even if we wanted to say, okay, it's ambiguous, does uh, saved him from death mean saved him from dying? Or does it mean it's that, that, that God saved him from the place of death? Uh, right. All you have to do is read the text. And Jesus dies. Now, Jesus is said to die over and over and over again and to be raised from the dead it, in and Hebrews. And if I could... If I could just add this, David, at the end of Hebrews, Hebrews 13, verse 20, uh, notice what it says here. It says, this is the benediction at the end of the letter. Now may the God of peace who brought again from the dead our Lord Jesus, the great shepherd of the sheep, by the blood of the eternal covenant, equip you with every good work that you may do his will. Notice the God of peace who brought again from the dead, that's resurrection, let mm -hmm. the scripture speak for itself. The context is very clear. Um, just looking at uh, uh, first, first last over here. First last over here is uh, keeps posting verses from Hebrews, uh, which talk about Jesus' death. Um, right. Yeah, and there are a bunch of them, and you also have the resurrection. Um, all right, uh, Diva Love Girl, do you have some more? I'm scrolling through here. Uh, I'd be happy to take any more questions or objections um, that you have. Uh, all right, here's one. Uh, it's sort of loosely, loosely connected. Um, Danny Danny says, uh, how do you justify human sacrifice if the Old Testament was against it? Okay, uh, human sacrifice, let's put this in context. Uh, usually in the case of human sacrifice, uh, people who were sacrificed were unwilling candidates. Uh, they were screaming and kicking as they're being taken to the altar to be killed. Um, we're not talking about what the Aztecs did, what the Mayans did in, in South America. There is a saying among the Jews in the Talmud that the, the life of the righteous, the death of the righteous atones for sin. So there is a Jewish concept of the righteous, the life of a righteous person making atonement for the nation and for the people. And this is a very strong ingredient of Judaism. Uh, you read this, for example, uh, not just in the Talmud, you read this as well in some intertestamental writings. Second Temple Judaism has a lot to say about this. The, the great example of this is the offering of Isaac uh, in Genesis 22. When uh, rabbis looked at this, the rabbis actually said it was it was some rabbis actually believed Isaac was killed. He was actually put to death and that God raised him uh, at that point. So that some uh, rabbis would say that the blood of Isaac made atonement for Israel. And in the Jewish prayers today, they will ask God to have mercy on them and may the sacrifice of Isaac be an atonement for us. So what Jesus did was he did not, uh, he was not taken against his will to be sacrificed in a pagan context. Jesus as a tzaddik in Hebrew, the idea of the tzaddik, the righteous one, uh, Isaiah 53 says that uh, he, he carried our sorrows, he took our iniquities upon himself, and then it says the Lord laid on him the iniquity of us all, and that he offered up his body and soul as a guilt offering. That's the language of Leviticus. So Jesus said, I lay down my life. Uh, of my own accord. Uh, no one takes it from me. I lay it down because I love my sheep. So what Jesus did was not a human sacrifice in the context of a pagan uh, sacrificial system. What Jesus did was he gave his life as the Lamb of God, and he gave his life in the context, in the Jewish context of the life and death of the righteous making atonement for Israel. So unless you understand that, you're not going to understand what the New Testament means by the just dying for the unjust. Uh, and so Jesus Christ's sacrifice was not a human sacrifice. It was a, a sacrifice to God. It was a holy sacrifice. The Bible describes it as a sweet smelling savor unto God. That is not the language of a pagan human mm -hmm. sacrifice. Mm -hmm. So uh, the Bible is against human sacrifices in that pagan sense, but the Bible does say that someone is going to lay himself, lay down his life for the sins Correct. of others. And again, um, Danny, Danny, that is in the Old Testament. So that's not something that Christians came up with uh, later. Um, a stranger, and that, that's actually the name here. I'm not saying that he's a stranger. Okay. A stranger says, uh, he quotes Mark 10, 18. Jesus said, why do you call me good? Uh, that, well, uh, so he says, why do you call me good? 
no one is good except God alone. So clearly, Jesus is saying the only one who is good is God, and he's not good, so he's not God. So that is a, a common objection that comes up. What do you think? Right. Right. Well, the first thing we have to to ask the question is, what is the context? Again, it's the rich young ruler coming to Jesus. Uh, he's patronizing Jesus. Yeah, good teacher, good master. What must I do to attain eternal life? And Jesus uh, retorts and says, well, uh, why do you call me good? No one is good but God alone. Well, the first thing we need to ask is, does that mean Jesus isn't good? Well, I've heard a lot of Muslims talk about Jesus was a good prophet. Uh, he was a one of Allah's greatest prophets. Um <clears throat> If that was the case, if that is to be taken in a woodenly, uh, wooden sense, David, mm -hmm. then why would Jesus refer to himself as the good shepherd, mm -hmm. uh, etc.? He would not even use that of himself. So there's something else going on here. You wanted to add something, David? Oh, I was I was just going to point out exactly what what you were what you said that Jesus is the good shepherd. So Jesus believes that he's good. Right. He does believe he's good. So right, yeah, right. So, so what is he doing then? Well, let's look at the context. This young guy comes to him. What must I do to inherit eternal life? Jesus says, okay, why do you call me good? Do you understand in calling me good? You are calling me God. Essentially, that's what he's saying. Do you understand the ramifications of what you're saying? Now, now you've got to follow the story closely. He then goes on to say, well, have you kept the commandments? Uh, and he says, well, which ones? Don't lie, don't, don't steal, et cetera, et cetera. He, Jesus quotes the Decalogue. And then this young guy has the arrogance to say, I've kept all of these since my youth. Basically, I've never broken any of the, of the commandments, which we all know. The reader knows that this guy is just arrogant and full of himself. So what does Jesus do? Jesus prods him further and says, well, if you want to be perfect, uh, I want you to sell everything you have and come and follow me. And then it says he was very displeased because he had many riches and he walked away. Now, notice very carefully, David, what does this show us? Jesus knew his heart. He knew that this young man, even though he claimed to kept all the commandments, in fact, broke the very first commandment of the Decalogue. The first commandment says, you shall have no other gods before me. And Jesus demonstrated that this guy was an idolater who worshipped money. And that's why Jesus says you cannot serve two masters. You can serve God and money. So the implication there is this. Jesus hit right to his soul by showing him that he was a violator of the number one commandment of the Decalogue. He worshiped money as its God. How would Jesus have known that? Well, again, there is, there is this irony that's going on there. Do you realize in calling me good, you're calling me God? Now, did Mark believe Jesus was deity? Absolutely. We see that right at the beginning uh, at his baptism, uh, where Mark quotes from Malachi and Isaiah, uh, the Lord says, I'm going to send my messenger before my face, and he shall prepare the way before me. That's God speaking through Malachi and Isaiah, and yet John is preparing the way for Jesus. And then in Mark 14, at his trial, Jesus stands before the, the high priest, and the high priest puts him under oath and says, Are you the Son of the Blessed One? Are you the Christ, the Messiah? And Jesus says, I am, and you shall see the Son of Man seated at the right hand of power and coming with the clouds of heaven. And then it says the high priest stood up and he tore his clothes and he said, you have heard his blasphemy. Well, what's the blasphemy? Well, the blasphemy there is that there's nothing blasphemous, David, about claiming to be the Messiah because there was a lot of messianic mm -hmm. contender. There's nothing, nothing blasphemous of saying, hey, I'm the Messiah. What is blasphemous, however, is to say that you're the son of the blessed and to say that you're the heavenly son of man who is actually a divine figure in Daniel 7 who comes with the clouds of heaven. Every figure in the Bible that is described as coming with the clouds of heaven is, they're all references to Yahweh who rides the clouds. And then there's this figure called the Son of Man who is associated with an Ancient of Days, another figure called the Ancient of Days. There's that plurality again, David. Mm -hmm. The Ancient of Days, and you've got a figure called the Son of Man, and this Son of Man comes with the clouds of heaven, meaning he's a divine person. And he judges the world. And then it says all the nations will worship him. He's an object of worship. So when they're doing the same thing they did with Hebrews 5, 7. They're looking at one verse, telescopic vision, tunnel vision. They're ignoring the rest of Mark. When if you read the rest of Mark, you will realize that Jesus Christ is fully God and fully man. Mm -hmm. So this is why context is so important. Yeah, so uh, a stranger, you should read Jesus' words in the light of everything else that he says. Uh, notice, 
Uh, it it kind of reminds me of, um, it's the same thing Muslims do with, with a passage like, uh, you know, uh, again, we were talking about earlier, the, the Shema, um, that, that God is one. And then they'll say, oh, God is one. And then they'll, they'll, uh, they'll give it an Islamic meaning or doing it with the Quran, right? They'll, they'll take a pet, they'll take a passage that says, um, no bearer of burden shall bear the burden of another. But then when they tell you what that said, they'll say, oh, it said no one can bear the burden of another. That's not what it said, right? Right. Just like here, people will go to this and say, ah, Jesus said, why do you call me good? So you see that Jesus is saying he's not good. That wouldn't make any sense given everything no. Jesus said. Right. He doesn't, he does he, Jesus doesn't say I'm not good. He says, why? Right. Do you call me exactly good? Exactly right. Why? Exactly right. It's a question. Why do you call me good? Exactly right. Um, not a denial of his own goodness, or he'd be no. contradicting himself. That's right. Um, this is another one from Diva Girl Love, and it actually ties into what you were just uh, what you were just summing up there. Um, Diva Girl Love says, "Okay, let me ask another question: Was Jesus and the Father uh, did they both eternally exist?" We have to qualify our words here. When we use Jesus, mm -hmm. we are speaking of the incarnation. Yeah, That's the name that he received when he was incarnate, when he became a child in Bethlehem, which we just celebrated at Christmas. Uh, eight days later, he was circumcised, and it was at that time he was given the name Yeshua, Jesus. What we mean, what you're trying to say is, did the Son and the Father eternally exist? Yes, the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit eternally existed the son became incarnate was born of the virgin mary and he was given the name yeshua jesus for he shall save his people from their sins and so it is theologically incorrect it's sloppy theology to say jesus was with the father or with god from all eternity what we mean is the son who became human in the person of jesus the son was eternally with the father and the holy spirit mm -hmm. um this, uh, I have another comment here. This one goes back to uh, your commentary on Isaiah 53. Uh, Tom J says, uh, hey, did the Jews before and around the time of Jesus believe that Isaiah 53 was talking about Jesus, let alone a person? I think it would be odd to expect the Jews before Jesus to expect that it was going to be about, G that it, that it was about Jesus. Um, but uh, I think he, what he's asking is, uh, because he goes on to say, Jews keep giving excuses such as that it was talking about all of Israel. So I right. uh, think what he's saying is, is this actually a person? Now, to be clear, that is what the text says. It's a person right. who is right. who's dying for others. But he's going with the uh, common response that we get. No, this is talking about the nation of Israel. What do you think about that? Right, right. Um, the idea that Isaiah 53 is referring to the nation of Israel is actually a very, very late development. It actually originated in the 12th century with a Jewish commentator rabbi called Rashi, R-A-S-H-I. And Rashi uh, was the first to argue that Isaiah 53 was referring to Israel as the suffering servant of the Lord. Now, the rabbis of Rashi's day uh, criticized them severely and said, what are you talking about? This is referring to, Yish to Mashiach bar Yosef, Messiah, the son of Joseph, who will come to suffer. And in fact, the, the Babylonian Talmud and the rabbinic writings, all of them say this refers to the Messiah. So the idea that this refers to Israel can be dismissed because it is something that came much later. It was not the view of the Jews in the time of Jesus that it referred to Israel. It referred to a person. The Jews in the time of Jesus were of the opinion that there were two messiahs. There was uh, Mashi uh, Mashiach ben David, who would be the, the Messianic king, who would come to rule and destroy the nation the uh, enemy nations of Israel. And the other view was that there was Mashiach uh, ben Yosef, uh, the Messiah, the son of Joseph. This Messiah, they believed, would be pierced through, that he would die for the sins of the people. And if you read Isaiah 53, it says that this servant was without guile in his mouth. It says that he had done no wrong. Uh, there was no, no sin in him, um, that he was being wrongfully accused. That can't be said of, said of the nation of Israel. In fact, in Isaiah, God calls his, uh, his people, he says, who is, who is so blind as my servant Jacob? He's blind, and, and he, he accuses Israel of not only being blind, but disobedient and rebellious, and that they had abandoned him. This cannot be said of Isaiah 53. That servant has no sin. And it says he offers himself as a guilt offering. And then it says, 
for the for the sin of my people, for the iniquity of my people, uh, was he uh, was he punished? In other words, he suffers for the sin of the people. Well, how can the people be the people? Obviously, there's two different. This, these are two categories here. For the sin of my people, for the iniquity of my people, uh, did he receive this blow? And so we need to understand that uh, the Jews up until the 12th century understood this to be the Messiah. And there's only one candidate who fully uh, fulfilled that, and that was Jesus of Nazareth. He was the only one who was pierced through. He, his grave was made with the rich. He was buried with the rich. Joseph Arimathea was a rich man from the Sanhedrin who buried him. And then it speaks about him rising again. It speaks of him seeing his, his offspring and, and being glad. And then it speaks about his exaltation. My servant shall be highly exalted, and all the kings of the earth will, will be in awe of him. Only Jesus of Nazareth fulfilled that passage, and that's good. Um, Jeremy Martin, uh, the, we have a lot of uh, questions and objections involving Isaiah 53. But he says, Isaiah 53 doesn't remotely fit with Jesus or Jews. So he's agreeing that it, it doesn't make sense to apply that to uh, the nation of Israel. Apparently he's just saying that it, does, it doesn't remotely fit with Jesus. So I th I th Well, it's been the number one passage, David, that has mm -hmm. caused many Jews to become followers of Jesus. Mm -hmm. In fact, the many Jews that I know personally who've come to faith in Jesus or Yeshua, HaMashiach, Jesus the Messiah, and are now following him, it was Isaiah 53 that convinced them. Uh, and, and I've read it to, to some of my Jewish friends, uh, and I said, well, let me read this, this, this text to you. And I would read it, and I'd say, who does this refer to? And they would say, oh, you got to be kidding me. That's so obvious. That's Jesus. And they did not know it was in the Tanakh, in their Holy Scriptures. Um, and so um, in the New Testament, Isaiah 53 is cited as a fulfillment of Jesus. It's cited in uh, John's Gospel. It's cited in the book of Acts. Um, who else but Jesus of Nazareth fulfilled that passage? There's no other uh, claimant to that passage. Yeah, uh, my friend uh, Anthony Rogers, he has Jewish family members. He said uh, <laughs> he started uh, reading Isaiah 53 to one of his Jewish relatives and... Uh, they said, "Stop! We're not talking about the New Testament. We only believe. We only believe. <laughs> we only believe in what you call the Old Testament." And Anthony's yeah. like, that, "That's Isaiah. That's 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 from your book, right?" Yeah. Um, another time, uh, Sam Shimon and I were talking to a uh, a woman who had converted to Islam, um, and fortunately, she's no longer a Muslim, but uh, she had converted to Islam, and we. We're, we we were reading Isaiah to her, and so we just read Isaiah 53 to her, and we said, who's this talking about? She goes, Jesus. And so it's just amazing that someone can say Isaiah 53 doesn't remotely fit with Jesus yeah. or Jews yeah. when, gosh, if you read it, it's someone who's uh, pierced for our transgressions yeah. and so on. Yeah. And and not only that, David, it, it, he starts from very lowly beginnings. He's uh, He's, uh, he's so insignificant, and it even says that we, we esteemed him accursed by God. So the number one, uh, the, the standard Jewish view today among uh, many Jews today is that Jesus was cursed by God. He hung on a tree. He was crucified. That's exactly what Isaiah says. Mm -hmm. um, Maria here says, if Jesus takes on our sins, then why do we pay for our sins upon death? Well, we don't pay for our sins upon death if we're believers in Christ. If we're not believers in Christ, then... Uh, the penalty of sin remains upon us, and the wages of sin is death. But if we are in Jesus Christ, our sins have been forgiven us. Well, there is now no condemnation, Romans 8, 1 says, to those who are in Christ Jesus. And so, as believers in Christ, um, our, our sin debt has been paid. And so, at death, we go into the presence of Christ. To be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. But if we reject Christ, if we are not in Christ, if we reject the atonement He has made, then we will die in our sins. And in fact, that's what Jesus said, that we would die in our sins if we would not acknowledge him to be who he was. Um, mm -hmm. uh, this is a uh, this is comment. That, look at this. Hey, guys, everyone check this out. <laughs> what a loser here, right? So this guy made a fake account, Sira International, to uh, copy Al Fadi's <laughs> channel. And then he goes around posting nasty comments pretending to be Al Fadi. Oh, really? And then he's going to come... And criticize us here, right? Like how? But you can you can actually click on it and go to the channel. It's not Al Fadi's channel. But notice he copies it in every way, and then he goes around pretending to be Al Fadi, uh, posting nasty comments. 
Um, but uh, yeah, let's go and read it. Um, Act 17 Apologetics. Did you made a video to justify the terrorist attack Donald Trump made? No, I didn't. Uh, you admitted that you are a diagnosed psychopath with no empathy. That's true, but totally unrelated to what you just said. Your fabricated Iranian friend have names. Uh, I have three Iranian friends. One of them, interestingly, is named Cyrus. Um, so apparently they still use the name Cyrus over there. Uh, the other two are named Muhammad and Khadija, and they're actually married. A Muhammad and Khadija. So that is uh, that is very interesting. Um, so hope... <laughs> Hope that answers your 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 comment from your uh, fake account. All right, uh, uh, all right. Here's here's one from Danny. Danny, Jesus can be seen even pre-incarnation, right? So I guess he's I guess he's talking about the uh, the angel of the Lord there or yeah. something. Mm -hmm. um, the Father can't be seen. How are they equal then? Well, they're equal uh, in the sense that uh, Scripture maintains their equal uh just because one is seen and the other is not uh has nothing to do with their equality how that relates i don't know you, mm -hmm. you haven't made that clear mm -hmm. but here's the other thing you brought up a very interesting point here uh danny is it danny danny uh, danny 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 uh you you brought up a good point here the jews also believed in the concept of an invisible and the visible yahweh so this lends uh into the argument i made earlier that they believed in two yahwehs two powers and one of them was uh, the invisible Yahweh, who was not seen, and the other one was the visible Yahweh, who appeared as the angel of Yahweh, the messenger of the Lord. And therefore, um, there, in, in Christian theology, we speak of God. Uh, there's two Latin phrases we use in theology, Deus absconditos, which means the hidden God, and then Deus revelatus, who is the God who is revealed. The Father uh, has remained invisible. He was never seen from what we can tell in the Old Testament. In the New Testament, it says in John 1, 18, no one has seen God at any time. But then it says the only God who is in his bosom, he has revealed him. Well, who is this God who's never been seen? But then there's this one who is the only God who's in the bosom of the Father. He has been seen and revealed. So uh, what this shows us is that there's something we call the economical trinity, which basically means that the persons of the trinity um, work together to achieve their purposes, and one of the things we learn is that the Father is never seen. The Father is never sent. The Father always sends. He sends the Son. He sends the Holy Spirit through the Son. The Son becomes incarnate, not the Father. The Holy Spirit is the one who empowers the church. Uh, so there are roles within the persons of the Trinity. But the question of invisibility and visibility really has no relations to the equality between the persons. Jesus is said to be in Colossians 1.15, the image of the invisible God. He is the true interpreter of the Father. He's the one who's explained the Father to us. Um, but there is no tension between that and the equality of the person. Just because one of the persons is visibly seen does not mean that he is less equal than the first person or the third person. Mm -hmm. um, let's go ahead and put this uh, comment up from Medhead101. How can Jesus be fully God and fully human at the same time as per the Trinity? Uh, the Son doesn't know the final hour, but the Father does. So two objections here. Um, but uh, as far as Jesus being fully God and fully human, uh, he's uh, objecting to that. Mm -hmm. Well, um, there's no contradiction here because what we're saying is that nature and person are not to be confused. Uh, the nature of something is what we would call an ontological uh, reality, uh, 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 being or nature is is what something is. Person is is a who, who is something, who is someone rather, that is personality. Jesus Christ is, <clears throat> is one person with two natures. How can he be fully God and fully human? That's like a physicist saying, all reality is made up of particles or waves, but light is made up of both particles and waves. How can light be both particles and waves at the same time? The physicist says, we don't know. It is. We can demonstrate it. How that can be, we don't fully understand. So because Christ is both fully God and fully man, there is no contradiction because mm -hmm. it's one person with two natures. There's nothing contradictory about that. Uh, just like the Quran, Muslims believe the Quran is both eternal and finite. They believe the words on the page of the Quran are eternal, that they have existed in the tablet before Allah, that, that in the, the Omar Kitab, in the mother of the book, so they will say that the eternal Quran became a book. 
think about that. This is an incarnation. The eternal words of Allah come down and are written down on bones and parchment, and, and then they're collated together into a book. So the, the Muslim believes that that book he holds in his hand is both the eternal word of Allah, but at the same time, the script, the, the ink is created, the paper is created. So you've got a Quran with two natures, eternal and finite. How can that be? Mm -hmm. Well, let's move on to Mark 13, 32. Well, when Jesus says, of that day and hour, no one knows. Well, the first thing I have to ask my Muslim friends is this. If you grant Mark, Mark 13, 32, then are you saying Jesus is the Son? Because he says, of that day, no one knows, neither the angels, nor the Son, only the Father. If that is an authentic saying of the historical Jesus, which even liberal scholars admit it is. Yeah, and, and, and by the way, they, they have to admit, they, they admit that this is because uh, they're not going to say Christians invented this saying, right. right? Christians were affirming the deity of Christ. So, Correct. So why would they? Why would some? Why would a Christian make up something about Jesus right. saying that and, he, and this he doesn't is the know criteria, the hour? That's right. That's this is the criterion of embarrassment, right, David? Mm -hmm. That they would avoid embarrassing statements of Jesus. But here's one where Jesus almost feigns ignorance. But the first thing our Muslim friends have to tell us is, if you believe this is an authentic saying of Jesus, then do you agree now that Jesus is the Son and God is the Father? If they, if they say no, then then what's then what's the point of having this discussion? In other words, you can't just play eeny, meeny, miny, mo with the Bible and say, well, we'll take this one, but that one can go. So mm. the first thing I have to say is this. If you grant that this is Jesus' exact words, then do you grant that he's the Son? And do you grant that the Father, that God is the Father? That's the first thing. So how do we respond to this? Well, there's a number of ways we can respond to this. Um, um, theologians have responded either by saying that Jesus Christ, since he is fully God and fully man, he was speaking in the context of his humanity here. And so as a human, he would not know the date of his return. As God, he would know. And so that's one interpretation. Another interpretation by St. Augustine was that Jesus was saying, well, if, if, if the Son doesn't know, then the Father doesn't know. Well, I think that's a bit of a weak interpretation. But another interpretation, David, that has actually become, I think it's gaining some momentum, is that sometimes the Lord will feign ignorance. For example, in Genesis 18, when the Lord there, the angel of Yahweh, when he appears to Abraham, and he's clearly Yahweh, he's called Yahweh, he's distinguished from the other Yahweh, he starts talking like this. He says, um, I will go up to Sodom and see if the things that are reported about it is true. So here's a case where he's talking to Abraham, and he's talking as if, He's going to check things out. I'm going to see if what's been said about Sodom is true or not, when in fact he already knew. And so there are examples where God says to Moses, um, I'm going to decimate all the Israelites, and I'm going to take you, Moses, and I'm going to make of you a great nation. And then Moses says, don't do this. The nations are going to say you're not a covenant-keeping God. There are, there are places in the Bible where God feigns ignorance for the sake of, of showing us a greater truth. So... In my opinion, I think that's what's going on in Mark 13, 32. But I also think that what's going on there is there is, uh, I think, the Son of God there is speaking in the context of his humanity. And so there he's trying to defer to the Father and saying basically that the Father is the one who ultimately determines uh, the end times. Um, and, and notice, everyone there, that, that you have a, a kind of hierarchy there, right? Right. Uh, Jesus says... Um, of that day or hour, no one knows, talking about human beings, right? So no one knows. And then he says, not even the angels, so he's moving up the ladder, here, not even the angels, nor the Son, but only the Father, right? So so Jesus is above all human beings and all angels, but then even in his incarnate state where he has entered creation, he's still above everyone else. And so... Um, yeah, my Muslim friends, if you want to use that passage, you got some problems there. All right, uh, Jeremy Martin here, and we'll probably, guys, we'll probably uh, cut out uh, within the next 10 minutes or so. Um, so we'll try to get to a couple more here. Uh, but Jeremy, Jeremy Martin clarifies what he means by saying that this doesn't sound like Jesus at all in Isaiah 53. Um, so he says, the man in Isaiah 53 was rejected by mankind almost universally. Jesus had a huge following, 
you say only Jews rejected him. That's not what Isaiah 53 says. So um, his objection here is uh, in Isaiah 53, the suffering servant, he's rejected by almost everyone, whereas Jesus had a huge following during his life and uh, an even bigger following now. So I th that's what he meant when he said that there's no way this can be Jesus. Well, he was rejected uh, on a national level. The New Testament makes it clear that the leaders of Israel uh, rejected him. Uh, you see that in Matthew 12, where they uh, they basically accuse him of exercising demons by the power of Beelzebub. And it's after that that Jesus basically predicts the destruction of the city, the destruction of the temple in Jerusalem, and basically says, your house will be left unto you desolate. And so in Isaiah 53, it's clear that the us there, the, the plural pronoun, is referring to the nation of Israel, which did nationally reject him. And that's not to say that they weren't a few 12 apostles and then a few others that came in that accepted him. But even the apostles, if you look at the end when he was crucified, they which, abandoned which, him as which, well. Yeah, which is what this passage is, is focusing on, right? Yeah. The, the emphasis yeah. in Isaiah 53 is right. Jesus being pierced for our transgressions. And so that's exactly. the emphasis there. And by that time, yeah, I mean, who... Exactly. Even today. I mean, if you look at most Christians today, there are more Gentile Christians today than there are Jewish Christians. So the fact that Judaism even today rejects Jesus as Messiah on a national level. In fact, in Judaism today, if you claim to be a follower of Jesus, you're regarded as dead. You're not even regarded as Jewish anymore. So that that national rejection is still going on today. But if you read Isaiah 53, it begins with, in verse 1, who has believed what ha he has heard from us? To whom has the arm of the Lord been revealed? The servant here is aghast that his message is not even believed, but that it's rejected. It speaks about him uh, growing up from like a, a dry root out of dry ground. There's no majesty in him. There's no beauty in him. He's despised. He's rejected by men, a man of sorrows, acquainted with grief. We turn our faces from him. He's despised. But then it says, like you said, David, earlier, He's borne our griefs, he's cared our sorrows, yet we seemed him stricken, smitten by God and afflicted, but he was pierced for our transgressions. Which Jewish messianic pretender was ever pierced mm -hmm. for our transgressions? And then it says, we all like sheep have gone astray, and, and the Lord's laid on him the iniquity of us all. It, it talks about how he was oppressed, he was afflicted. It says, he like a lamb, there's that lamb language, a sacrificial, like a lamb that is led to the slaughter, like sheep that before its shears are silent, he did not open his mouth. Now that doesn't mean Jesus didn't say anything. What it means is he didn't say anything in his defense. He in fact incriminated himself before the high priest. Uh, and then it talks about he was cut off, which is a Hebrew word that means to experience a violent death. He was cut off from the land of the living. Uh, and that uh, he, was, uh, he made his grave with uh, 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 the wicked with a rich man in his death. Uh, and it was the will of the Lord to crush him and put him to grief. And then it says that his, uh, that his soul makes an offering for guilt. But then he would prosper in, uh, the will of the Lord will prosper in his hand. Out of his anguish, his soul will, will, shall he see and be satisfied. And then he says, by his knowledge shall my righteous one, my servant, make many to be accounted righteous. And so, and notice the language there, David, through my righteous one, he will make many righteous. So the righteous one makes many righteous. And that is what the New Testament calls justification. We've been justified by faith in the Messiah. So, I, again, I don't know why Jeremy has issues with this, because um, if it's not Jesus of Nazareth, then who under God's blue sky could this refer to? Mm -hmm. It's not the nation of Israel. Who is the only candidate that we know who was pierced and that was esteemed as accursed by God? The only candidate is Jesus of Nazareth. Mm -hmm. um, we have, uh, I actually have a cool uh, a cool comment to, to close out with, uh, and I'll hand that one over to you, Anthony. But um, before that, um, gosh, what's his name? Um, where did he go? Uh, Let's Talk Religion is, is claiming that uh, the, the Quran verses that talk about Allah being uh, the best of deceivers is is act, should actually be uh, translated as planners and so on. And I don't have a I don't have any problem translating it as planners or schemers or so on as long as 
as long as it's the kind of planning and scheming that involves deception, right? Because right. that's that's where that's where the word uh, that's where the word comes from. And in the context where you have this, you have it in uh, sort of three fifty four and sort of eight thirty. In both contexts, it's talking about deception. You, you, you said, no, 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 this is just saying that they planned one thing, but Allah planned another. Right. Um, no. If you if you look at what Allah actually does, he tricks them into believing that they crucified Jesus when they hadn't. Also, the you have, the, you have uh, something very similar, uh, possibly worse, uh, in the context of Surah 8, where Allah tricks Muslims to going out into the Battle of Badr, right? How does he do it? He gives Muhammad a dream, convincing Muhammad through his dream that there's only a few people coming. That is not, it's not a big army coming. Then Muhammad wakes up and says, ah, I got a revelation from the great God Allah that it's only a small army coming. Then they go out there and fight and they're outnumbered three to one, right? So Allah is explaining, hey, I had to I had to trick you. I had to trick you because uh, that was I needed to do that to go out and to get you to fight. And so... In both con in, in both passages where you have Allah being referred to as the best of whatever it is, it involves deception, right? So, right. so uh, don't know why you you'd uh, want to deny that. I mean, why why would you want to deny that that Allah is the best of deceivers, right? I mean, he's bragging there about how many uh, how many people he tricks. Um, and keep in mind that uh, the reason, according to Islam, the reason you have uh, Christians today is because Allah did such a great job tricking people into believing that Jesus died, right? So you can't you can't blame the you could say the Apostle Paul corrupted Christianity or something like that, but at least part of the corruption you have to blame on Allah, right? The Christianity wouldn't have gotten off the ground without belief in his his death on the cross, and that Paul didn't do that. Allah did that, according to Islam. Allah did that. So Allah is the one who corrupted Jesus' life and work. So don't uh, don't lose sight of that. All right, uh, we're going to close out with uh, this one from Big Daddy. Um, Big Daddy says, I never believed in Muhammad's teachings as an 18-year-old born Muslim. So he's saying he, uh, he was born he's born in a Muslim household, but he never believed in Muhammad's teachings. Well, that's smart. That's smart. Um, I would have also had trouble believing Muhammad's teachings. Uh, he says, I never believed in Muhammad's teachings as an 18-year-old born Muslim. Please show me the way and the truth so that I can be saved and see you in heaven. So, Tony, go ahead and... Uh, Say whatever you want to Big Daddy here. Okay. Well, Big Daddy, uh, the good news is this. You can't save yourself. I can't save you. David can't save you. God so loved the world that he sent his son into the world, that whoever believes in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. And Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father but through me. Jesus calls us to repent of our sins, turn away from our sins, believe that he is the Son of God, the Christ, the Messiah that he sent into the world, that he died on the cross of Calvary for your sins, and that if you trust in him, turn from your sins, believe that he paid that penalty uh, for your sins, and that you believe that he rose from the dead. The Bible says, if you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord, and believe in your heart that God has raised him from the dead, you shall be saved. For whoever calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved. And so, Big Daddy, if you do that tonight, if after this show you get on your knees and you cry out to God, confess that you're a sinner, that you have broken his law, and that you are lost, and that you believe that Jesus Christ came into the world to save sinners, believe that he died for your sin, that he was raised from the dead, if you believe that, God will change your heart. And the thing you need to do next is you've got to find yourself... Uh, a good body of believers, a good local church where they teach God's word, where they teach it without compromise. And uh, if you need help, stay in touch with David or myself, and uh, uh, I can even help you find a church in your local area. All right. Well, uh, thank you, Tony. And uh, thanks, everyone, for joining in right now. And uh, we're going to go ahead and sign off now. It's 930. And we'll catch you all next time uh, in the comments section. So afterwards, not in the chat here, but in the comment section, let us know what topics you'd like us to cover in the future. And again, if you want to see more from uh, Tony, the link to a channel that he works with here on YouTube is in the description box. All right. Catch you all later. See you next time.